Hi there everyone, my name is Nick Hopwood. This is the fourth in a series of videos that I'm putting together on qualitative analysis. We've looked at the encounter between the analyst and concepts. We've looked at the idea of what am I trying to do? Is it an or the interpretation? There was a video about a practical iterative framework for qualitative analysis. What do I want to know? What are the data telling me? What's the relationship between those things? This is a video that was inspired by a book I read as an undergraduate and I think it has real relevance um, to us as social scientists and as qualitative analysts. Uh, it's, there are 10 points, so I'm going to go through them quite quickly. Um, and I'd be really interested through interaction on Twitter or on my blog if you'd like to, um, to develop the discussion on any one or more of these things. So I'm going to switch over to some slides now and come back to the video at the end. So the book that I'm going to talk about is this one, To Interpret the Earth, 10 Ways to be Wrong by Stanley Shum. Now I read this when I was a geography undergraduate and I've come back to it many times since. And what I'm going to suggest is that there are real lessons from what Stan Shum said about why interpreting the physical world is difficult for us as qualitative analysis, analysts in interpreting data about the social world. So there are, what I'm trying to do is translate what he said is difficult about geomorphology, which is about explaining how landscapes form, mountains, cliffs, bays, volcanoes, that sort of thing, to this, the sort of work and challenges that we confront as social scientists, social phenomena and qualitative data. He has three categories of ways to be wrong or difficulties, space and place, cause and effect and system response. Uh, I'm not sure the language is particularly useful or exactly right for us as social scientists, but I'm going to stick with it for now and just try for this point to make the translation between his ideas and our context as social researchers. So I'll go through these 10 different ways to be wrong or challenges that face us as qualitative analysts. The first is time. Now, often we have the question of how long do I need in the field? That's a classic question for ethnographers. And that's juxtaposed or countered by how long you have for analysis. For every extra interview you do or extra day you spend in the field, certainly if you're in doctoral work, but also in other kind of uh, funded research, and then you're taking a day off the time for analysis. And maybe you get more out of less data by giving yourself more balance of that time for analysis. Now, there are all sorts of things. If you're doing observational research, stuff happens really quickly. You miss it. People seem to think sometimes that video is the answer. I totally disagree. Um, but also in interviews, you only have a certain amount of time. You never get to cover everything. So because of time, our data is also always partial. But also things happen slowly, too slowly for us to document in our research in one doctoral project of three years, even in a lifetime as academics. Significance can take a long time to emerge. The meaning of things can take a long time to emerge. Longer than has been available to the people you might be interviewing, certainly longer than may be available to us as observers. So we have the difficulty of trying to connect what's inevitably a snapshot kind of research, even if it's, you know, years in the field. In some social terms, it's still a snapshot with longer term problems. Now, the spatial part of what Stamshun was saying is that he says complexity increases as resolution increases. Now, that's interesting. So he's saying the finer grained our attention, the more detail we look in, the more things we have to account for. Whereas when we step back, the world tends to look simpler. There are maybe fewer factors to consider. Now, that might seem to be a little bit counterintuitive. But in fact, what I'm suggesting is complexity also increases as we step back because there might be too many contexts or factors. So what's the best scale of resolution for us? We go into too much detail and we're like the story of the emperor who wanted a map of the world that was so detailed it kind of reproduced the world, in which case it's no longer a map. But if we stand back too much, then there's far too much historically, politically, socially to take into account. So accuracy and precision, I think, are affected by the scale of our inquiry. But whether how easy it is to know what that effect is and whether it's kind of catastrophic or marginal or irrelevant to our research is a tricky issue. Then there's a location. Now, this is really a kind of what applies here applies there. And this could be understood as a problem of generalization, i.e. what I found in this situation, can I say it's likely or certain or unlikely to happen somewhere else? But we could also say that this is to do with the location of the researcher. How you 
what located in relation to others in the field. So in my history, that's been as an adult who's not a teacher in schools, trying to do research with young people, as a male non-parent in very female um, parental uh, parent dominated uh, services which are for parents where most of the practitioners are themselves parents there are all sorts of things to do with being an insider being an outsider issues of age gender race um, previous relationships or new relationships and building trust so location is a tricky one then we have a, a set of uh, ways to be wrong or difficulties that are to do with cause and effect and the one that Stanley Shum comes, calls conversion is also to do with equifinality. The idea that different processes or causes, or in the social world it could be attitudes or beliefs or actions, can produce similar effects. So what looks to us to be the same actually comes about because of different reasons, or comes about in a different way through a different causal mechanism. So if we say, for example, we find a headmaster and a student tell you the same thing about the school, what sameness can we infer? Is there really a sameness in their experience or in their belief? What about if a female leader and a male leader in an institution tell you the same thing? Is that the same? What kind of sameness can we assume there? If two people score the same on a test, what sameness can we infer? So the same performance there, but not necessarily the same understanding, perhaps. The opposite of convergence is divergence. That's it, that the same causal process may produce different effects. So where we see difference in the world, we don't necessarily have grounds to assume difference in causal processes or mechanisms leading to that difference. We might mistakenly say that there are two phenomena or mechanisms in play when really there's only one and the difference is produced by something else, not by the causal mechanism. So we could have sameness masquerading as difference. Then we have the question of efficiency, and this is one that's really powerful in geomorphology, and I think it's interesting to us as social sciences. The idea is that in geomorphology, more work done doesn't necessarily mean more results. So in the physical world, you could have a river flowing for years and years and years and years and years, and that might not necessarily mean a particularly big change in the landscape. Something very brief and intense could make a bigger change. And in social science, we can think of elaborate interve interventions. What's the point of doing research where you have a very complex, perhaps expensive or difficult intervention, and you show that, I don't know if it's in a school, oh, kids do a little bit better. Or you might have a very complex intervention in some sort of a professional practice and you find that the outcomes for patients are better if it's in healthcare or something like that. The problem is that's a big thing with apparently a small effect. Who's going to want to bother wasting the time and energy trying to get all these people to learn how to do this thing new and comply with it when this effect is small? We also have to remember that effectiveness depends on antecedent conditions over time. That means how sensitive people are to what we're about to present to them in terms of change is dependent not only on the kind of the people or the, the, the phenomenon that you're working on, but the conditions there. I'm much more interested in social research in small things that have big effects, high efficiency, where less work done means more results. But that's not always guaranteed when we investigate or intervene in social phenomenon. Then there is multiplicity. And this is kind of the, the coming together of those convergence and divergence ideas. Multiple causes act simultaneously and in combination. So it's very difficult to say that because I've seen this, this must be the only mechanism or process or feature in play. You might say, for example, let's look at a particular person's trajectory through a career. And you might say, is it racism that's affected them there? Is it sexism? Is it homophobia? Is it something else? It's rarely the case that people exist in a kind of, not a vacuum bubble, but a vacuum with only one thing in it. Often there are lots of things simultaneously acting. Not only do they act at the same time, but they interact. So that racism and um, fem sexism and homophobia might not only both act kind of in parallel and separately, but they might act together and produce something different. So this is not the idea that there are kind of multiple explanations. This is that when multiple things are going on, they can kind of be an interaction. So we have a problem where we can't say, oh, well, there's just one cause of this, one reason for this, one explanation, one mechanism, one process. But just simply coming up with a list of lots of them isn't very useful either, because it doesn't tell us what to do about them, doesn't tell us which ones to manipulate if we want to achieve change, doesn't really improve our understanding just to say there's 20 different things that cause this. 
Now we get into the final category, which is what Stan Shum called systems response. Singularity is the first one of these. And this is about, well, what makes something different from something else? So this is, could be, in social science, we think about unique case studies. Why would we pay particular attention to this case? What is it special? You might have a case study of one thing because it's really unique and it's the only time people have managed to do something, or it's the first of something, and that's very interesting. But any kind of pattern or prediction, so descriptive pattern or some kind of prediction, implies a number greater than one in the sample. So they actually say nothing about a particular case. Now that's, it kind of matters when you start doing things like randomised trials in health and they tell you which pill might be better overall for the different groups that have been involved in the trial. It never tells you which pill is going to be best for you or for that patient that the doctor is seeing. Patterns and predictions don't tell you what to do with the case, but maybe what we need to do with this particular case or instance is exactly what's important. So this is the opposite of the problem of generalisation. Sometimes generalisation is unhelpful. And that's you always need to ask is why do we want to generalise? Then there is sensitivity. And I've kind of alluded to this before, that the liability, the propensity for something to change or its sensitivity to change is not uniform. In some situations, a small change can lead to a big disturbance and that can be a hugely good thing. If you're trying to find out how we can boost children's literacy skills or uh, reduce social inequalities in a particular neighbourhood. If you know which are the areas of those problems which are sensitive to change, that's where you want to go in with your intervention. Proximity to a threshold is really interesting. It happens in geomorphology when a system can suddenly be close to the threshold or be made close to a threshold. You can have a big earthquake and what used to be a stable mountainside can get very close to a threshold and become very unstable. It only takes a small rainstorm or a small snowfall to suddenly have a big catastrophic effect. So, <clears throat> but it's not easy for us to tell in the social world how close we might be to thresholds. And there are lots of invisible thresholds that we don't even know to look for. So that is why our life is difficult. And then we have the idea of complexity. And this isn't just simply that things there's a lot of going on. A 747 or an A380 aircraft are complicated. There's lots of wires and bits and devices and mechanical things, and electronic things. But it's knowable. You can map it. You can draw it. You can measure it. Complexity is something that's in almost kind of unknowable in a finite sense. There could be lots of responses to perturbation or change or intervention, unintended consequences, unanticipated consequences, things that don't have a linear relationship. You could apply the same conditions twice and get two different outcomes. You could get the same outcome from two different processes. This is kind of all these nine problems coming together into play. So that's a very quick run through of why I think Stan Shum's ideas of 10 ways to be wrong in the geomorphological world, when we're trying to explain and understand how the physical world changes, map onto ways in which we might think about why is it difficult for us as social researchers analysing qualitative data. You may find that some of those ideas don't really fit the kind of research you're doing. You may not say I'm involved in prediction, but often we're still trying to explain or suggest a mechanism or a process behind things. And I think it's a really good counter to our kind of Sometimes accidental arrogance as researchers to say, yeah, we know why this person said this. Or we know that if they've said the same thing, that we're inferring sameness. All those kinds of things. I imagine this might be quite a frustrating video because I've said how difficult life is for us and I haven't presented many solutions. But hopefully some of the other videos in this series will help think through some of the challenges of qualitative analysis. The reasons why it's difficult is also why the reasons why it's so rewarding and uh, why the researcher is so important. Without these difficulties, it wouldn't really matter. We could get robots to do it. That's why our minds, our judgments, our creative insights, our intellect are really important. And that's what makes it really fun as well. I hope you've enjoyed this video. See you soon in the next one. Goodbye.